record. All yep. right, welcome back. Another class in class with Carr, Dr. Greg Carr. All right, cream of wheat, out of here. Um, <laughs> Aunt Jemima, done. Quaker Oats, 130 years. We have been eating Aunt Jemima with the syrup, the pancakes, with the black lady on. They changed her look to make her not look like an enslaved person. And she looked like a modern woman, got a perm. Yes. Now she's gone. And I'm like, good, good riddance, oh. but we didn't have a problem with Nancy Green. That's her name. I didn't even know that was her name until recently. It was Aunt Jemima. Oh. So, Dr. Gray Carr, tell me why either we should be celebrating, just like the statues, her coming down and yes. Kima Wheat and all the other places that they're removing black symbols of <laughs> slavery, <laughs> Lando Lakes, you know, I mean, it's, just, it's a lot. Tell me why we should either celebrate or honor her grandson or a great a great nephew is mad because it's like she, you know, she fought hard to, you know, live her life making pancakes for people and serving white folk. All right, tell me why I'm wrong for that. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You know, no, I don't. It, this, this is almost a running theme of our Saturdays, uh, a running theme of our class, because I know sometimes we do more than one a week, but the idea is that you know, history is complicated. History is lived by real human beings. And I could get the family being angry. In fact, when, uh, you know, earlier when we were going back and forth, when, when the idea came to mind, when you said, you know what, let's talk about Nancy Green, the original Aunt Jemima. Uh, you shared with me some information, I guess, as a lady in Chicago who's trying to trace her down, you know, put a, um, put a headstone on her grave. She doesn't have a headstone. And in a, wait, so pause for a second. Is, she was so important that she's buried in an unmarked grave. She was so important. How about that? that Not unusual. Because if it hadn't been for uh, Alice Walker and then a bunch of black women, Zona Hurston wouldn't have a headstone. Um, you know, George Washington Williams, who was the hero of many black historians, including John O. Franklin, who wrote his biography. John O. Franklin had to find George Washington Williams' grave in England and get a headstone. For it, I mean, George Washington Williams, that he wrote books that Carter G. Woodson read when he was in Oliver Jones' little parlor in West Virginia when they was all coal miners. And Woodson's job as a teenage boy was to read the newspapers to the brothers who couldn't read, who were veterans of the Civil War, some of them. And they stocked the whole little room in this little house with books and newspapers. Woodson's job was to read. And one of the books he read was by George Washington Williams, which inspired him in part to become a historian. That brother didn't have one of the early black historians. So it's not unusual for us not to have headstones. I mean, it, it, in fact, I'll say one other, Elaine Locke, the great philosopher. I went to Elaine Locke's funeral. That's a story for another day because his ashes stayed out of the ground until about, about five, six years ago because he died without any heirs. He died without any family. I mean, he was a gay man in the 1930s, 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Not that he couldn't have had children, but the woman he worshiped in his life primarily was his mother. His mother predeceased him. And she was buried in DC, but gentrification, moving stuff out. They moved all those graves out into Maryland and we don't know where his mother is buried. I mean, so it's not unusual for, you know, for these, these kind of things. I'm saying that to say that Nancy Green becomes a figure but, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, because uh, as you're talking. No, no, let's not be talking. No, no, I know. Yeah. As you're talking, I'm, I'm wondering about the importance of burial to Black people. Like, is that something that is germane to us African-wise? Because I feel like, like my dad died and, you know, he had bought his tomb, his headstone and his grave way back when he was in his 30s because he wanted to make sure nobody had to worry about him. Yeah. And what happened was his sister died, right. his mother died, and he ended up having to give up his grave for his family members. So when he died, and they lost his tomb, his oh. headstone. So I'm like, I'm never going to a grave site. My daddy's not there. I'm not putting flowers on anything. I'm not that person that's gonna, is, and maybe it's unusual, but I'm like, why do we put such value on like monuments even to go to a gravesite. Is that African? Am I seeing something wrong? And as you're mentioning all these unmarked graves, I want to celebrate the life of that person through yes. continue to talk about them, not go visit yes. them at a gravesite. But please tell me how I should see this. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I think there is a book by Cecilia O'Leary called To Die For. She talks about the place of sacrifice in building um, 
in building the idea of a country, of a nation. And what she does is go through the, uh, the rituals of American identity. So many of them are, are, are tied up with blood sacrifice. In fact, there's another very good book that I, I kind of like, I like. I like these together. It's called Blood Sacrifice and the Nation. Um, I forget the name of the, auth the author's name, but the name of the book is Blood, Sacrifice, and the Nation. And in that book, what you see is that what the, the, these, two, these two scholars ask a question. They say, what, you know how Western anthropologists like to look at other societies and say, this is a tribal custom of the, you know, people in Malawi or here we go to Micronesia and we see this is how they honor their dead. She said, what if these two authors of Blood Sacrifice in a Nation, and it's kind of a similar theme in Hazel O'Leary's To Die For, because what, I'm mean, uh, Cecilia O'Leary, because what O'Leary does is mark some of the holidays, Memorial Day, you know, Flag Day, you know, the President's Day. I mean, why are these, the Star Spangled Banner, when does that become the National Anthem? Why do you need these rituals? And then how many of them are militaristic? Because, you know, a lot of these statues getting pulled down are military statues. Why are we got these damn soldiers? Because killing and dying is at the center of the idea of the, the Western nation. You know, I mean, because you go overseas, Napoleon, you go overseas, Richard III, whatever. I mean, you just got, you're going to have these, these this, this, this whole notion of death is at the center of sacrifice and, and the session of, of identity. So in Blood, Sacrifice, and the Nation, what Which these two by, authors by say Ka is- you know, uh, Carolyn Marvin, I just looked it up. Carolyn Marvin is the author of that. Carolyn Marvin, very good. Thank you, thank you. Very important. Because when she says, then Professor Marvin says, and her co-authors say, you know what? What if we use those same terms and just looked at America? So they got like a picture of like when Eisenhower died, President Eisenhower, and he's laying in state in the Capitol Rotunda, and you see people and they come in, they walk around the casket. It's like the caption is, you know, the Americans come to circle their fallen leader before they take him to the cemetery. Then you go to Arlington National Cemetery on Memorial Day and you see the flowers. They say these, the tribe begins to put the flowers on the graves of its dead so that those ancestors won't come back to haunt them. I mean, all this kind of, I mean, in other words, don't take America out of human rituals, death rituals, because those death rituals mm. are what reinforce the tomb of the unknown soldier. I mean, all these kind of things. So no, it isn't particularly African in a broad human sense. However, it is absolutely African in terms of how we manifest. Many times we manifest how, how we honor the dead. So for example, the, the Kikongo people, Bakongo people of Central Africa, Robert Fer well, Bunseke Fukiao, who's a Congolese scholar, writes about this and talks about this, but most people would know it if they know it at all from the work of uh, Robert Ferris Thompson, who's an art historian, really, cultural historian at Yale University. Uh, he's retired now as an elderly guy from Texas, white dude, very interesting scholar. He says, you know, the idea of dirt for Black people is very important. And dirt, in a sense, dirt, plants, organic material, it's the, or, it's the origin of the, uh, the charms or paquettes you see in Haitian Vodun. It's the whole idea of having something from where you're from. So you may have a little piece of dirt, you put in something you carry with you or something. That's, it's, it's also the origin of the idea of organic material. You know, Black people come in and say, you know what? It isn't just hygiene when you go in the beauty parlor or a barbershop and be like, let's sweep my hair and burn that hair or give me my fingernails. But it isn't just me being in tight. You don't want anybody to have anything that's off you in case they want to harm you. Speak something into it, wrap it up in a little package, put it on a doll, wish you. I mean, so it's like all this stuff, superstition. No, it's a connection to the organic nature of life. So where our people are buried has always been important in African societies. You don't see a lot of African societies engage in like, you might see in India or other places where somebody dies, you burn them, you send them back to the answer, you, you, you transform the elements. No, black people won't put you in the ground and they won't put you somewhere where they can return to you from time to time. So in the South, for example, where we see cemeteries vanishing with gentrification, it's very traumatic for some people because that's what they do in homecoming church homecoming. The, the burial ground is by the church. So you go wash the graves, for example. I've, I've helped, you know, every time we go to Alabama, you know, the, the graves of my mother's parents and grandparents, we wash those graves. Old people in the South know what that is. Young people too, if you've done it, you go and you make sure the graves are white. Sometimes you put lime on them. You clean the grave. In other words, you're tending to your ancestors because in that worldview, which is imminent, a number of different African worldviews, but the idea is you tend to your ancestors because they tend to you. So even if you don't have a body, 
You have a picture at your house. It's not unusual. Somebody's born in the black community. Give me a give me that baby picture. Why? I gotta put that picture in that same mirror that's got all these other pictures. <laughs> right? So why? Because these are your ancestors. Some of these people still alive. There you are when you were six months. In other words, you're part of a community, and the dead are still part of our community. So no burial rituals are very important for us. So yes, Nancy Green should have a headstone, and it shouldn't just be a scholar. And yes, her family should feel some kind of way. But the thing about Nancy Green is. Nancy Green is part of a mythology that is absolutely artificial. <laughs> Nancy Green is the first woman to play Aunt Jemima, but Aunt Jemima is not Nancy Green. This is, this is where the thing, in fact, the best book on this, as a brother who wrote a book a few years ago called Slave in a Box. Wow. Slave in a Box, Maurice Manring. If, if you get Maurice Manring's book, Slave in a Box, which uh, is, it kind of, he kind of expanded. He'd been working on this for a number of times. He published some articles in scholarly journals. And there's been a lot written now on Aunt Jemima. My thing is, for my money, start with Slave in a Box, because it's the history of Aunt Jemima. And this thing is all about marketing, mass production, white women, and white men. <laughs> he got nothing to do with us, except the stereotype. What does it mean? Chris Rutt, Charles Underwood. Let's go back to 1888, 1889. They're in Missouri. They're in Missouri, St. Joseph, Missouri, and they got this. Uh, they they bought uh, they bought this milling factory. They make flour. You know, you flour for camps and people. You know, do what they do. You know, you selling flour. You selling flour, and then they're like, "How are we gonna make some money off this?" So their idea is, we need to create a product that we can mass market to get rid of this surplus flour because they just selling flour. So we can make pancakes. Okay, so, so they start experimenting with different recipes. They come up with a combination of wheat flour, corn flour, lime phosphate, and salt. So you gotta add milk, you got pancakes. That one worked, they tested it, okay. So now they wanna mass produce and sell this stuff. Okay, fine. While they're doing this, they go to a minstrel show. This true story. Guy gets slave in a box. He walks through all this, right? They had the minstrel show, because you know, this is 1889. People love the minstrel show. What is the minstrel show? Read Eric Lott's book, Love and Theft. Read any of the work of William Lehman, his book, Jump Jim Crow, uh, Blacking Up from a Generation Ago. There's a lot of stuff been written about this by recent scholars, or go back to the time itself and go read the black newspapers. Because see, the thing about scholars is, when they say, oh, this is an undiscovered part, no, just go, you know how you discovered it? You went back and read <laughs> the black people who were talking about it when it was going on. So, <laughs> no, I, I get you. I, I, you know, I'm going to buy the book. I'm going to read the book. But don't act like we weren't confronting this at the time. But the one thing I will say, though, in, in respect of all these scholars who write about these subjects now is that by writing about it now, you're doing what Vincent Harding said we need to do. You gotta make it contemporary. So respect on that. That's why Slave in a Box is so good. So he, so he treats it, these guys go to the minstrel show. They love the minstrel show. What is the minstrel show? It's mostly working class or working poor whites putting on black makeup, pretending to be black. And in Eric Lott's book, Love and Theft, he talks about this blackface minstrelsy and the American working class. He's saying these white people feel better about themselves because they clown the black people, which reminds them they not black people. That's really what these stereotypes are. Jim Crow, uh, Zip Coon, his cousin, who's like the city version of Jim Crow. And all we got to do, whether it be uh, the, the film Ethnic Notions or all the films we've seen discussed, if we want to think about them in today's terms, go to any black movie. The loud eye roll, the, the neck buck, you know, this kind of thing. All this thing, it make people feel better because I'm, you know, I'm not you. And, and like Dave Chappelle said, when I figured out they was laughing at me and not with me, I'll see y'all later. <laughs> In other words, yeah, because I mean, they like they like when you play the crack addict. Why? Because it's like they ain't laughing with you, they laughing at you. So the whole point is that they go to the Minstrel Show in 1889 and they see a performer. Baker and Farrell had a routine. Baker and Farrell, two minstrels at this show. They doing the cakewalk and they call the tune they're walking to, the dance, the old Aunt Jemima. They was like, yo. <laughs> There's our market book. There it is. Why? Because the pancakes work. We can make them fast. We're selling some. But you know how we're going to really sell them? 
y'all know that white people everywhere, they're going to eat some uh, black lady cook. There it is right there. <laughs> if it's a black cook, or it's a black cook on the joint, we good. <laughs> so what happens is <laughs> they, the first Aunt Jemima on the box is the minstrel picture. The straight stereotype, just like the first uh, cream of wheat on the box was Uncle Rastus. Rastus was another one of these coon figures, one of these minstrel figures, not looking like a human being, the black face figure. In fact, we would have to talk about this another day because ultimately Disney puts a living Aunt Jemima in one of their exhibits uh, at, the, at the recreation park. And of course, we know Disney started a lot of that minstrelsy because Mickey Mouse is a black faced minstrel. There's a whole line of scholarship on it. Oh Look at God. it. Black with the white in the nose. Oh no, it's a whole, it's back. It's, I had a book over here now. Anyway, we had to talk about that another day. Those early Disney cartoons, please. Yeah, I'm glad they're going to the Princess and the Frog and getting rid of my man. Where my man at? I had him over uh, here a minute ago. Mr. Zippity Doodah. Yeah, Uncle Remus. There's wow. Uncle Remus. Joe Chandler Harris, Song of the South. Yeah, Disney getting rid of it. But you had Aunt Jemima flipping pancakes in one of your exhibits with the fake story that Aunt Jemima was a slave out of Louisiana who was cooking for an old colonel who was down there. And then after the war, she moved north and with her husband. Wow. They gave Aunt Jemima a husband, Uncle Mose. And Uncle Mose would get everybody's stuff off the, off the stagecoach, come in, Aunt Jemima had the pancakes, and they had an exhibit at Disney on this. I mean, so you could come in there and see her flipping pancakes. So yeah, yeah, all y'all wasting y'all money at Walt Disney. And Stone Cold racist. Mickey Mouse was a black-faced minstrel. But we talk about that another day. So Aunt Jemima, they put the first one on was the minstrel picture. And then they, they went out of business. Ruitt and Underwood went out of business. They sold the business. R.T. Davis was a marketer who bought it. Purred Wright, he hires Purred Wright. Purred Wright is a writer. So they come together and they say, you know what? We're going to get this better. They find, they said, we're going to put out a campaign and we're going to find us a living agent mind because they trademarked the name. See, trademark, copyright, you know this better than I do. They're yeah. two different things. I'm working on Trademarks it. can go forever. Copyrights, you got to renew. If you can trademark that name, that's your name. I got the trademark. So they trademark Aunt Jemima. They change the formula a little bit. They add powdered milk. What does that mean? Now you need is water. We got it. We good, we good, we good, we good, we good. <laughs> we need... Now we need a living Aunt Jemima because we're going we're gonna to make up a backstory and she's going to have her flipping pancakes. So what do they do? They put out a campaign and they identify a woman who was born in Montgomery County, Kentucky during enslavement, 59 years old, Chicago. Her name is Nancy Green. They say, Ms. Green, yes, we'd like you to become Aunt Jemima. Fast forward to 2020. This ain't no different than any Madison Avenue pitch. They looking for the human being, fast forward to 2020, on a commercial. Y'all gonna see that lady selling Popeye's chicken in a minute. Hey, that chicken for Popeye. In other words, oh, look, we need a person. <laughs> the box, this thing, we'll get rid of that coon image. This is the model, we're going into the 20th century. We need a, and where do they debut her? In 1893, Chicago hosts the Columbian World Exposition because they're celebrating in, 18, in 1892, the anniversary, well, I guess it'd be 1492 to 1892, the 400th year anniversary of Columbus getting lost. So now, but the World's Fair is the Columbian Exposition, the 400 year thing in the United States gonna be in Chicago. And in Chicago, they set up Nancy Green flipping pancakes at the World's Fair with this big stage, and she is a smash at the World's Fair of 1893. Oh, I'm sorry. And they add her picture to the box, and they give her a quote. Eyes in town, honey. That's the quote. <laughs> Eyes in town, honey. Aunt Jemima is in town. I'm flipping them cakes. Now, here's the thing that make you, that'll really make you, man. Oh, I'm sorry, Purred Wright? Oh, I'm sorry, Purred Wright. He's the writer they hired, right? Purred Wright's like, yeah, 
The image is good. The box is good. She was a hit at this World's Fair. Let's put her on the road, and I'm going to give her a backstory. He publishes a pamphlet. The name of the pamphlet, The Life of Aunt Jemima, the most famous colored woman in the world. He makes up a whole backstory. We found her in Louisiana, where she was still making pancakes long after the Civil War in a little red cap. Her husband, Uncle Mose. Artists, he makes this whole story up. Now, here's the thing that really makes you mad. Well, a number of things make us mad, right? Because we ain't even gotten into the 20th century yet. <laughs> Here's the thing that's really crazy. 1893, the Columbian World Exposition, and Jemima in there flipping pancakes. I'm sorry, Nancy Green in there flipping pancakes under the name Aunt Jemima. They done wrote her a backstory and everything. Who else is there? And not because they invited them. Fred Douglas, I Garland Penn, a writer, journalist, and the great Ida Bell Wells. Ida Wells, Fred Douglas, and, 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 and I Garland Penn write a pamphlet because black people wanted this the 400th anniversary, right? Yeah, well, you know, F Columbus, but uh, we black, we here, we want a display on what black people have done in world history and in the United States. World's Fair is like, shit, hell no. We ain't gonna tell y'all no. <laughs> so what, is, what does Ida Wells do? Because, you know, Douglas get, lends his name to it. And some, but, you know, Fred Douglas is going to be dead in two years. The Lion of Anacostia is about at, out at the exit. But he's, he's like, I'm feeling you, Ida, on this. I'm feeling you, I Garland Penn. You young bucks, go ahead and do this. They write a pamphlet called Why the, American, why the, why the Colored American is Not at the Columbian World Expo. They write a whole critique of the whole thing. They come with the pamphlet to the World's Fair. World's Fair people are like, shit, you ain't got no pavilion, so you can't sell this here. Now, all these people, I respect people saying, we Americans, you know, we be like, okay, all right, I ain't gonna argue with y'all, but I'm gonna tell you how they got their pamphlet out. The Haitians had a pavilion. The Haitians was like, yeah, what did they say? They said, we couldn't sit, come on, cuz. The Haitians gave out of Wells and them space in the Haitian pavilion to sell the pamphlet, why the colored American is not in the Atlanta. Because they said, we are fam. Come on now. We related. Yeah, I'm from Haiti. Yeah, you from the United States. But look, we're family. Come in this pavilion and you put that out. Now, picture that. In one part of World's Fair, out of Wells is in like, this is some bullshit. In another part of World's Fair, Miss Green flipping pancakes and Jemima eyes here, honey. <laughs> so, I mean, wow. this is the bizarre nature of white nationalism. They have figured out how to extract value from black stereotype at the same time living black people are like, nah. And who's caught in the middle? Miss Green, who, by the way, makes it up into 1923 as. Um, as Aunt Jemima. I read a couple of articles that speculate because they put her on a tour, national tour a little bit. She might have been in Atlanta in 1895 at the International Cotton Exposition. And if she was there, that means she was flipping pancakes in Atlanta the same time Booker T. Washington was giving that famous speech in Atlanta, we can cast down your bucket where you are because that's where he gave the speech. So anyway, so you got Miss Green operating at the same time and they making money. So what happens? She gets hit by a car in Chicago and died. She dies then. Aunt Jemima, oh, I'm sorry. Let's go back 20 years before she passes. In 1903, they changed the name of the company to Aunt Jemima Mills. Because this woman, like Bessie Smith made Columbia Records, like, you know, Capitol Records, Nat Cole, Capitol Records, like when Ray Charles flipped the script and when he left uh, when he left uh, uh, Atlantic and went to ABC, so I want my masters, like Sam Cooke was like, I want my masters, like Barry Gordy started Motown. They understood the lessons who had been learned by, like Jay-Z said, you're going to pay me for what you owe the Cold Crush Brothers. In other words, now we understand the power of our brand. But back then, they would take that brand and make whole companies. They changed the name of the company to Aunt Jemima Mills. Quaker buys it. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go forward three years to 1906. They lynched your black people. 1906 is when, of course, they had the, uh, uh, what happened in 1906? The Atlanta riot, the Du Bois writes about. Oh, it was in 1904. Yeah. But anyway, 1906, they start a promotion. They say, we're going we to we give y'all for, for three, what is it, for three cents, no, for six cents, we're going to give you six pennies. We're going to give you coupons. 
or you could give us three zero thirty cents and we send you an Angie Mama doll. They gave them both offers. More people pick the Aunt Jemima doll. We want the doll to sit up in our house while we making these pancakes. So guess wow. what? You know what I'm saying? So that was the doll campaign was 23. That's the same year Miss Green passed away with the art with the uh, car accident. Two years later, Quaker Oats buys Aunt Jemima, and they engage in another search from 1933 to 1951. Anna Robinson is the living Aunt Jemima. From 19 then she's followed by. Uh, a sister named Wilson, Edith Wilson. Edith Wilson is Aunt Jemima. In other words, the reason Aunt Jemima was so powerful was because there was a living person on radio, living person in ads, living persons. In, they had a, they had articles in Ladies Home Journal. They placed the article in Ladies Home Journal in 1917 to say, here's the backstory of Aunt Jemima. That's where they have Uncle Moe's and all that. And that's where the story gets blended in because they say she was a living person who made these pancakes. We finally convinced her to sell the recipe and that's what you eating. That's a lie. The white boys made that recipe up in 1889. They brought the sister in a few years later to personalize it and how the white women playing this because the way they marketed it was you white women in y'all kitchens and we know it wasn't white women in the kitchens it was black women in the kitchens we're gonna make your life easier all you gotta do is add some water and you got pancakes and it was a black woman just like in them old days don't you wish you was one of them plantation mistresses and then well we got a slave in a box for your ass i mean this, this, they marketing it to white women you know what i'm saying and of course we're now in the moment where they begin to see household appliances and begin to see you know ease and comfort so they've got this collision of plantation stereotypes ease and comfort white women being able to see themselves as domestic goddesses Ah, oh, yes, I'm in my kitchen with my automatic this and my automatic and my Aunt Jemima, and I'm listening to the soap opera, meaning what? The working class opera, because I am, a, and I have, and you ain't doing any of that. You got people in your family, I'm sure you do, like I do. My mother, I've been in some of them houses. You know, my father working all the time, my mother takes out side work, and she in the house polishing stuff, cooking. They calling her by her first name. I'm a little boy, like I'll punch this white boy in his face. But because you're the same age I am, I would never call my mother by her first name. But this is the stereotype that they're pushing these pancakes with. But you know, black people, black power movement comes, these niggas ain't having it. You know what? You gotta do something about Angie Mama. 1968, they switch out her Take bandana or yeah. handkerchief. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's all shit. We got And of course, it, it, the sister who's still alive, I, I said that last time I saw her exhibit on Aunt Jemima was at the New York um, Historical Society a couple of years ago. Oh, you, Sar, Betty Sar, the great black woman uh, artist, still alive. She's done this whole series of uh, art pieces on Aunt Jemima, kind of free that stereotype. I and mean, she's not alone. There've been another people who've done it. Uh, but this idea, in fact, uh, my man uh, who wrote "Slave in a Box," he had a uh, he had a phrase for it. Oh, uh, I can't think of the name of it, but it'll, it'll come to me in a minute. Hold on, give me about five seconds. If I just be quiet for a second, I can't think of it. Anyways, it's got "mammy" in it. It's like "mammy marketing" or "mammy marketing." Well, you gonna market the mammy? And we still see that archetype. So let's bring it to a close. We know in 1989, like you said, they give her some earrings, they give her a perm. But like Chuck D and Big Daddy Kane them said in Burn, Hollywood, Burn, we like, she still ain't your mama, even if she got a perm. But the whole complicated idea comes in with the idea, what do you do with that image? Because Cream of Wheat um, and what's the other one? Uncle Ben's right. Uncle ben. Right. They too try to put a human being on it. And then they try to do a little backstory. All these guys were chefs in Chicago. And then, you know, yeah, now nah, you want you want that beloved Negro that you trust feeding you, even as we read the history of enslavement and realize that that's the way we was able to poison a lot of these people was to feed them glass and all kind of other stuff. And, and, and James Madison's grandfather was probably killed by the Igbo women at Montpierre. There's a great book by Doug Chambers called Murder at Montpierre. Yeah, they cooked him many a good meal and he died. But, <laughs> but, but I mean, but, and, but the idea that you can trust black people to cook for you, Aunt Jemima's at the center of that. And, and I'll close with this. Because Quaker Oats had a symbol too, that Quaker dude. The difference between all of those and Aunt Jemima was that Aunt Jemima had the best developed backstory. They made her into a human being. And so it really turned into a thing where people felt a deep connection with first Nancy Green and then them other sisters. Because they, regardless, we, we don't care about your name. All we know is we need somebody to play you. And we will reward you by making you a beloved figure. 
Hell, we might even mess around and take that archetype and give it Academy Awards. I don't know. I still haven't seen Precious. Uh, you, you, we still yeah. might. I mean, in other words, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I mean, and that's no shade to the sister who, you know, played the lead role or to our sister who has pushed back against Oprah and all of them and say, you know, if they don't, you don't do what they like because it ain't got nothing to do with you as a human being. It's got something to do with satisfying the white imagination and the white stereotype of what black people are. And in this case, what black women are. And so, yeah, they gave up the picture. They will probably, I can't imagine they won't keep the name. And there's a whole body of scholarship too, which I kind of am really fascinated by, which tries to determine where did the name Jemima come from? I've seen some scholarship. And, I, and even if this isn't true, I just like it. The idea that Jemima might be an Anglicization of Yimiya. Because we know Yimiya is one of the Yoruba Orishas who along with Oshun is like the mother. Like they control the water, either the river or the ocean. So Yemiya, is that where Jemima came from? They couldn't say Jemima said, well, if it is, it's an Africanism, which means the original Aunt Jemima is on the other side of the water. And if y'all mess with her, she will drown all of y'all. So I mean, <laughs> and, and there's some art that kind of gestures toward that during the black arts movement. When you look at the black, they got pictures of like Aunt Jemima as a Yoruba goddess and she putting the water on them. It's like, okay, I see you. But we're not, we're not out of the woods because they took her picture off because the idea of Aunt Jemima is still there and that's a contested legacy. Well, we're gonna keep having these conversations and we're gonna free people's minds and maybe yes. the rest will follow. Let no me uh, let me thank you again, Brother Carr. I thank appreciate you, you Dr. You. Dr. Greg no. Carr in class with Carr. <laughs> Sister Hunter, professor. Listen, appreciate you. Subscribe, uh hit the like button and and follow him at Africana Carr on Twitter because he needs to be followed uh everywhere. And I'm gonna follow you. And subscribe you now because you know Karen is not playing. She's changing the whole game up. We taking it back. <laughs> Don't tell him that. All right. Love you. Right. Uh, that's, that's not okay. true. That's okay. Yeah, <laughs> Love it's, you it's too. It's true though. Bye. Talk to you later. Next week. <laughs>